I ask my colleague, uh, Trustee Stepanek, would you please convene the Committee on Institutional Advancement? Thank you, Chair Monville. On today's agenda, we have one consent item and three action items. The consent item is the approval of the minutes from the September 2015 meeting. If there are no objections, the meetings will be, will be approved as submitted. The first action item on today's agenda is a facility naming request from California State University, Los Angeles. Vice Chancellor Garrett Ashley will present the request. Thank you, Trustee Stepanek. This item will consider naming the Tennis Center at California State University, Los Angeles, as the Rosie Casals and Poncho Gonzalez Ten Tennis Center at the Billie Jean King Sports Complex. This naming recognizes and honors three individuals who inspire Cal State LA students and embody the university's focus on pushing boundaries and reaching beyond expectations. Billie Jean King, an alumna of the university, Rosie Casals and the family of Pancho Gonzalez have worked tirelessly on behalf of students. With their assistance, the university has raised more than $2.5 million for the tennis center. The proposed tennis center will include a new building adjacent to the existing tennis courts. The first floor will include men's and women's locker rooms, administrative offices, a concessions kiosk, and an athletic training facility. The second floor will include indoor and outdoor viewing areas, the Sally Ride and Tam O'Shaughnessy Learning Center, and a full kitchen. I now turn this over to President Covino to say a few words. Good morning. I'm, uh, I'm very pleased to have the opportunity today to speak about one of our most distinguished and deeply involved alumni, Billie Jean King. Uh, Billie Jean King's selfless work on behalf of Cal State LA demonstrates the essence of compassion, caring, and giving back. For 18 years, the Billie Jean King and Friends Gala has helped Cal State LA transform the lives and futures of our students, raising millions of dollars for Cal State LA student athletes. Tennis star Rosie Casals has played a critical role in this endeavor. She's become a part of the Cal State LA community and an executive champion of our dedication to engagement, service, and the public good. The family of Pancho Gonzalez also shares a bond with Cal State LA. Like the university, the family is committed to helping youth realize their full removing the obstacles that stand between them and success. The naming of the Rosie Casals and Pancho Gonzalez Tennis Center in the Billie Jean King Sports Complex not only pays tribute to these three outstanding individuals, it represents a collective commitment to work on behalf of our students and our community. The new center will enable the university to further serve our students and our region by promoting physical fitness, athletic skill, and learning that strengthens our bodies and sharpens our minds. Trustees, thank you for affording us this opportunity. Thank you, President Covino. Are there any comments or questions? Not hearing one, agenda item number one, the naming of the Rosie Consales and Pancho Gonzalez Tennis Center at the Billy G. King Sports Complex is an action item before the Committee on Institutional Advancement. Only committee members may vote at this time. Do I have a motion to approve? Do second. I have a, do I have a second? Great, thank second. you. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? The Rosie Cons Tennis Center at the Billie Jean King Sports Complex. President Covino, would you please escort Billie Jean King and Rosie Consals to the lectern where they will be joined by Chancellor White and Chair Monville. Well, Billie Jean, we are continually grateful for your generosity towards the California State University. Your legacy as a native Long Beacher, as a Californian, as a Golden Eagle, and as a tennis champion exemplifies the excellence that we uh, strive to instill in our students every day. 
And Rosie, we're deeply honored and privileged uh, to highlight your legacy through the naming of this facility as well. Your remarkable, incredible achievements, uh, numerous Wimbledon and U.S. Open championships, to just name a few, is an inspiration to all of us and to all of California. And of course, we're honoring the life and legacy of uh, Pablo Gonzalez, a native Angelino, a Californian, a native veteran, uh, who Navy veteran, who overcame incredible odds to become a tennis champion. And again, a true example of the sort of dedication and focus to excellence and the perseverance and motivation to achieve at the highest levels things that we try and we are successful in instilling in our students every day. Billy Jean, would you like to make a few comments, please? Good morning. Uh, thank you, uh, Chancellor White. I appreciate that. And to uh, the members of the board, S uh, the CSU presidents and guests, uh, I'd like to thank uh, President Covino um, for his great work so far at Cal State LA. And also uh, Janet Dial is with us today, who um, is our university advancement person and also our athletic director, who's been very instrumental in this effort is Dan Bridges, who are sitting over there. So I'd just like to acknowledge them because every single person uh, is so important and so integral to making things happen. Uh, I won't uh, go into the naming again too much there because you've already said it two or three times I was gonna say it. Um, but I just want you to know that we're really interested in uh, helping the kids, the students, and when I say kids, I mean everybody at the university uh, to uh, be champions in life. That's what we're trying to do. Uh, Rosie Casals played in the public parks at the San, in the uh, Golden Gate Park uh, in San Francisco. Uh, Poncho Gonzalez, uh, who had nothing, he had a 50 cent racket. Nobody, he was very uh, ostracized. Uh, and he uh, played in the public parks in Los Angeles at Exposition Park. Um, he's one of my heroes, and Rosie's one of my sheroes. Um, and I'm really lucky, too, because I played in the public parks here in Long Beach. And uh, also my brother, Randy Moffat, played in the public parks, and he went to Cal State Long Beach. I'll give you a plug. And he be <laughs> Randy uh, became a Major League Baseball player, played most of his years with the San Francisco Giants, just so you know some legacy there at, at Long Beach as well. Um, these courts, as I've just mentioned, is going to create access. Without access, I mean, Rosie, Poncho, and I could have never had the opportunities. Um, I got into tennis by accident. A fifth grader asked me to play. I had no idea what it was. Um, so you just never know uh, how these facilities are going to make a difference. Uh, I played in five parks uh, every I went to a different park every day. So I know without access, you've got no chance unless you belong to a country club a lot of times in our sport. And most champions have come from the park system, just so you know. And what this is going to do is provide for the, the a community, for the entire community. East LA always needs help, always needs access to help everyone do well. As you know, Rosie uh, won a lot. Uh, she and I played a lot of doubles. <laughs> we uh, had a lot of fun. Uh, we won a lot. We were number one in the world quite a few times. Um, and I just wanted to make sure that her legacy and Poncho's legacy and all of us did um, that it would happen. Uh, I, I felt like they had been forgotten. And uh, so this is so important uh, that we have this. I think we'll probably have NCAA tournaments there. Um, we've got space for even more courts. We have nine right now, um, so which will be wonderful. Also, the Sally Wright and Tam O'Shaughnessy Learning Center, Tam, they're both doc, um, doctors, the late Sally Ride. Many of you know, uh, she was a really great tennis player, by the way. She was gonna try to be a pro first, decided that really wasn't her thing. And she ended up being, as you know, most of you in the room, I hope anyway, and if you don't, if the students don't know, you can Google her. Um, she was our first American astronaut, uh, woman astronaut. So it's uh, very important, and Sally was a really great friend uh, through the years and passed away from pancreatic cancer at 61 years of age and uh, has also started SRS, which is with science. But she was very close to Cal State LA. Her dad had been a trustee. Um, and also uh, Tam O'Shaughnessy's also another public park kid, Fullerton area. 
and uh, both of them became doctors in science. And um, so that's why the Learning Center uh, will be there. They've been very instrumental over the 18 years of coming to our gala every year and helping raise money. And Tam gave $500,000 of her own money. Pam Shriver, also a tennis player, Mary Carrillo, uh, both of them very successful. Mary's a big shot now on, in television. Pam's also an announcer uh, with different, uh, Pam's with ESPN. Uh, Shriver won many, many titles. She's also been very instrumental. Her former husband, Dr. Joe Shapiro, was a professor at Cal State LA and passed away from cancer. And so we have a Joe Shapiro um, scholarship as well. Um, also, the university has received a $1.5 million contribution in anonymously, which I'm going to try to find that out. And uh, <laughs> so I'm really proud that uh, we have our tennis center with, with Rosie's and Poncho's name on it, and our learning center with Sally and Tan's name. And um, we all come really from tennis, uh, so we understand how it gives us an education how it furthers our lives, helps us to be a team player, helps us to be leader, leaders, helps us to know how to support people. Sometimes you're a follower, not a leader. We understand how to be nimble, and it helped us all the way through our lives, and it still helps us every single day. So you never know how you're going to touch another person's life. You just never know. And I wore Power Red today because I wanted everyone to think about the impact each and every one of us can make. And every one of us is an influencer. So I just thank you for the influence that you're providing every single day when you have these meetings. Um, and the votes you, you take, they change lives. So I want to thank you. And I also want our heart to go out to Nohemi Gonzalez and her family and everyone at Cal State LA um, appreciates it. And of course, her last name is spelled the same way Pancho Gonzalez is. It, so it's ironic that uh, this has happened. but. Very sorry, and our sympathy goes to her family and to everyone connected to her friends. So thank you all very much. We appreciate your, your vote and your, and your confidence. So uh, we want to make sure we serve the community. So thank you so very much for having us today, and I'm very happy. 18-year 18, uh, 18 dream came true today. So thank you very much. <laughs> Come over on this side. Well, there are many uh, whereases on this uh, recognition of the naming that I will not read because I think uh, uh, Billie Jean's uh, words were exactly the whereases. But be it resolved by the Board of Trustees of the California State University that the Tennis Center at California State University, Los Angeles, be named the Rosie Casals and Pancho Gonzalez Tennis Center at the Billie Jean King Sports Complex. photo. Thank you for allowing, excuse us for a moment, <laughs> or continue, whatever. So is this just in the group? Rosie, this one's for you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Th
Thanks, Chancellor White. Yeah, we'll see you soon. Say, how are we going to decide? We're going to do a tug of war. <laughs> okay, the second action item on today's agenda is a facility naming request from California State Polytechnic University Pomona. Vice Chancellor Garrett Ashley will present the request. Thank you, Trustee Stepanek. This item will consider naming half of Building 80 at California State Polytechnic University Pomona as the Donald and Carolyn Lundberg Hall dedicated by High and Sheena Park. The proposed naming of the facility recognizes alumnus Eugene Park's $1 million investment in the expansion of the Collins College of Hospitality Management. The building consists of faculty offices, a student commons, two group study rooms, a conference room, a student room, a break copy room, a part-time faculty office suite, and two graduate classrooms. The Park family's history with the college stems from Father High Park's time as a student in the late 1970s. High Park credits much of his success at Cal Poly Pomona and his early career to the mentorship he received from Dr. Donald Lumberg, the college's founding professor. I now turn this over to President Coley to say a few words. Thank you, Garrett. The Collins College of Hospitality Management, one of our largest enrolled programs at Cal Poly Pomona, opened a $10 million expansion of the college that is entirely funded by donors. We would like one area of the new building to be named the Donald and Carolyn Lundberg Hall, dedicated by High and Sheena Park. As mentioned, High and Sheena Park and their family are longtime friends of Cal Poly Pomona. Both High and his children, Eugene and Eunice, are alumni. Father and son, High and Eugene, are prominent businessmen in the Inland Empire. In 2011, Eugene was a lead donor in the college expansion, pledging $1 million. The Parks Family Association with Cal Poly Pomona began in the 1970s when High was a student. He credits much of his academic and early career set success to the mentorship of Dr. Donald Lundberg, a professor emeritus and founding professor of the Collins College. High's son, Eugene, graduated from Cal Poly Pomona in 2007 and Eunice in 2010. In the last decade, the family has given more than $2 million to support alumni outreach and faculty development. Eugene regularly supports our intercollegiate athletics program and has sponsored the annual Bronco Golf Classic. I applaud the entire Park family for their generosity and commitment to education. They understand the need for learning spaces that support interaction and technology and are among our finest alumni role models in business and philanthropy. Their contributions are deserving of a building bearing their name and that of a founding faculty member. I would like to thank the Board of Trustees for their consideration in recognizing the Park's commitment to Cal Poly Pomona. Trustee Spanity. <coughs> thank you, President Coley. Are there any questions or comments? This is agenda item number two, the naming of Donald and Carolyn Lindbergh Hall, dedicated by High and Sheena Park, is an action item before the Committee on Institutional Advancement. Only committee members may vote at this time. May I have a motion to approve? So moved. Do I have a second? Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Thank you. The Donald and Carolyn Lindbergh Hall, dedicated by High and Sheena Park, is approved. With regrets, the donors are not able to be with us today. So the third and the final action item on today's agenda is a naming facility request from California State University Monterey Bay. Vice Chancellor Garrett will again present the request. Thank you, Trustee Stepanek. This item will consider naming the Business and Information Technology Building at California State University Monterey Bay as the Joel and Dina Gambord Business and Information Technology Building. 
the proposed naming recognizes the $10 million gift by Joel and Dina Gambord. The gift will support two faculty endowed chairs, a fund for student scholarships, and an entrepreneurial fund for students. This gift will support students and faculty in the College of Business, the School of Computing and Design, the Bachelors of Science in Nursing program, and all students with an interest in entrepreneurship. I now turn this over to President Ochoa to say a few words. California State University at Monterey Bay is very honored by this generous gift from Joel and Dina Gambord, the largest gift ever given to our campus. Joel and Dana Gambord together have been successful in real estate development in California, applying their tenacious work ethic, entrepreneurial spirit, and strong sense of community responsibility. In this spirit, they have designated their gift to Cal State Monterey Bay to endow two professorships, one in Joel's name for business entrepreneurship and the second in Dina's name for nursing. They have also provided generously to fund student scholarships. The Gamborts know the importance of taking risks, of being creative and innovative. To further their vision, they have also designated support to create an entrepreneurial fund for students to help them research, build, and launch products from concept to market. We are grateful for this generous and extraordinary gift. It will have a transformative impact on our campus for many years and generations to come. This wonderful gift will help our faculty and students positively impact our community in the areas of business, entrepreneurship, and healthcare. And it advances the vision of CSUMB as an innovative university committed to educating and inspiring future generations of local and global leaders. Joel and Dana could not be here today, but they have shared this message with us. And I quote, we're looking where we can contribute to supporting scholarships for qualified individuals in various disciplines that our society has a significant need for. For example, we feel there is a great need for an expanded supply of trained RN and BSN nurses as the healthcare needs in our country are expanding under Obamacare and a growing and aging population. There is also a critical need for individuals trained in information technology and especially business entrepreneurship. Young people coming along need to be taught how to start a business and make it successful. To be creative and innovative within the business community, it seems to Dana and I that our goals may fit well into the programs and curriculum presently being taught at CSUMB and especially the work in the new business and information technology building. End of quote. Thank you, President Ochoa. Are there any comments or questions? This is agenda item number three, the naming of the Joe and Dina Gambord Business and Information Technology Building. It's an action item before the Committee on Institutional Advancement. Only committee members may vote at this time. May I have a motion to approve? I have a, a, I move the motion. Second. Thank you. Any additional discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? The Joel and Dean Gambort Business and Information Technology Building is approved. Chair Monville, that concludes the business on the Committee of Institutional Advancement. Thank you, uh, Trustee Stepanek. Uh, we will uh, take a five minute recess and board of trustees in open session uh, at 1030. This is the California State University Office of the Chancellor's live stream. Please adjust your audio accordingly. This is the California State University Office of the Chancellor's live stream. Please adjust your audio accordingly. This is the California State University Office of the Chancellor's live stream. Please adjust your audio accordingly. This is the California State University Office of the Chancellor's live stream. Please adjust your audio accordingly. This is the California State University Office of the Chancellor's live stream. Please adjust your audio accordingly. This is the California State University Office of the Chancellor's live stream. Please adjust your audio accordingly. This is the California State University Office of the Chancellor's live stream. Please adjust your audio accordingly. This is the California State University Office of the Chancellor's live stream. Please adjust your audio accordingly. This is the California State University Office of the Chancellor's live stream. Please adjust your audio accordingly. 
This is the California State University Office of the Chancellor's live stream. Please adjust your audio accordingly. This is the California State University Office of the Chancellor's live stream. Please adjust your audio accordingly. This is the California State University Office of the Chancellor's live stream. Please adjust your audio accordingly. This is the California State University Office of the Chancellor's live stream. Please adjust your audio accordingly. This is the California State University Office of the Chancellor's live stream. Please adjust your audio accordingly. This is the California State University Office of the Chancellor's live stream. Please adjust your audio accordingly. This is the California State University Office of the Chancellor's your audio accordingly. This is the California State University Office of the Chancellor's live stream. Please adjust your audio accordingly. This is the California State University Office of the Chancellor's live stream. Please adjust your audio accordingly. This is the California State University Office of the Chancellor's live stream. Please adjust your audio accordingly. This is the California State University Office of the Chancellor's live stream. Please adjust your audio accordingly. This is the California State University Office of the Chancellor's live stream. Please adjust your audio accordingly. This is the California State University Office of the Chancellor's your audio accordingly. This is the California State University Office of the Chancellor's live stream. Please adjust your audio accordingly. This is the California State University Office of the Chancellor's live stream. Please adjust your audio accordingly. This is the California State University Office of the Chancellor's live stream. Please adjust your audio accordingly. This is the California State University Office of the Chancellor's live stream. Please adjust your audio accordingly. This is the California State University Office of the Chancellor's live stream. Please adjust your audio accordingly. This is the California State University Office of the Chancellor's live stream. Please adjust your audio accordingly. This is the California State University Office of the Chancellor's live stream. Please adjust your audio accordingly. This is the California State University live stream. Please adjust your audio accordingly. This is the California State University Office of the Chancellor's audio accordingly. This is the California State University Office of the Chancellor's live stream. Please adjust your audio accordingly. This is the California State University Office of the Chancellor's live stream audio accordingly. This is the California State University Office of the Chancellor's live stream. Please adjust your audio accordingly. This is the California State University Office of the Chancellor's live stream. Please adjust your audio accordingly. This is the California State University Office of the Chancellor's live stream. Please adjust your audio This is the California State live stream. Please adjust your audio. This is the California State University Office of the Chancellor's live stream. Please adjust your audio accordingly. This is the California State University Office of the Chancellor's live stream. Please adjust your audio accordingly. 
This is the California State University Office of the Chancellor's live stream. Please adjust your audio accordingly. This is the California State University Office of the Chancellor's live stream. Please adjust your audio accordingly. This is the California State University Office of the Chancellor's live stream. Please adjust your audio accordingly. This is the California State University Office of the Chancellor's live stream. Please adjust your audio accordingly. This is the California State University Office of the Chancellor's live stream. Please adjust your audio accordingly. This is the California State University Office of the Chancellor's live stream. Please adjust your audio accordingly. This is the California State University Office of the Chancellor's live stream. Please adjust your audio accordingly. This is the California State University Office of the Chancellor's live stream. Please adjust your audio accordingly. State University Office of the Chancellor's live stream. Please adjust your audio accordingly. This is the California State University Office of the Chancellor's live stream. Please adjust your audio accordingly. This is the California State University Office of the Chancellor's live stream. Please adjust your audio accordingly. This is the California State University Office of the Chancellor's live stream. Please adjust your audio accordingly. This is the California State University Office of the Chancellor's live stream. Please adjust your audio accordingly. This is the California State University Office of the Chancellor's live stream. Please adjust your audio accordingly. This is the California State University Office of the Chancellor's live stream. Please adjust your audio accordingly. This is the California State University Office of the Chancellor's live stream. Please adjust your audio accordingly. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'd ask that the meeting of the Board of Trustees of the California State University um, come to order. As we all know, uh, our dear friend and our trustee secretary, Ms. Hernandez, is going to be uh, retiring soon. So I will uh, give the floor to her for her last opportunity to take the role. So Ms. Hernandez. A very bittersweet moment for me, but um, here we go. <laughs> See if I don't. Trustee Brewer, Governor Brown, Speaker Atkins, Trustee Day, Trustee Eisen. Here. Trustee Fagan. Here. Trustee Farrar. Here. Trustee Fortune. Trustee Garcia, Here. Trustee Kimbell, Here. Trustee Lewis Giles Monville III. Uh, 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 well <laughs> <laughs> Trustee Morales, Here. Lieutenant Governor Newsom, Here. Trustee Norton, Here. Trustee Stefanik, Here. Trustee Taylor, Here. I'm sorry, Tr Superintendent Torlakson, Trustee White, <laughs> Chancellor White. <laughs> Chair Monville, we have a quorum. Excellent work, as always, Ms. Hernandez. Uh, this is the time we'll hear from public speakers. Uh, we will proceed with a period uh, for the public comments. Speakers have three minutes for their remarks. When a speaker's time ends, I ask that uh, you yield the microphone uh, so the to the next speaker so the, uh, the, to make sure that we have enough time for all of the speakers to address the board. Uh, with that, uh, our first speaker, uh, is uh, Richard uh, Shave followed by Jennifer Egan. Thanks. My name is Richard Shave and I live at 5166 O'Sullivan Drive in University Hills, which is adjacent to the parking lot at the Media Building at Cal State Los Angeles. I am a, from the class of 2005 from Cal State LA with a bachelor's degree in computer science, and I'm here to provide an update to the nearly seven-year-old problem of the noise from the University Student Union in our neighborhood, and, and we as a neighborhood are seeking a uh, policy-level solution to this problem. Um, 
our, our neighborhood believes that the interface, which I'm about to outline, should provide this solution. We're, we're seeking um, the Vice President of Student Affairs to oversee an advisory committee with our neighborhood, a robust sound policy for the university, which is responsive to our neighborhood, a neighborhood which is in the city of Los Angeles. And I know that the university wishes to be a good neighbor with this uh, policy and mechanical and electronic infrastructure uh, around the university student union to baffle and control noise levels. Uh, on these varieties of fronts, progress can be made, which as a sum, we, we believe should provide an acceptable solution for our neighborhood. We have had an initial meeting with the university in late September that included several, but not all departments integral to this solution. And I believe that we're getting a good sense of the work at hand. And I look forward to reporting on further meetings and our progress as we move into 2016. And I thank you for your time. Uh, Jennifer Egan, followed by Lillian Tays. Already. I'm sorry. I'm Doug Domingo Forreste, and I'm switching with Jen Egan here. My voice is a little scratchy from yesterday. Um, thank. I want to first thank uh, Chancellor White, who may have. Oh, there you are for coming to our for our, to our memorial for uh, Noemi Gonzalez. I really, we really appreciated it on the campus. So, uh, I'm the president of the CFA, the uh, camp, uh, campus chapter at Long Beach, and uh, I can't tell you how wrongheaded I. Th Taking off the cap of of the uh, of the uh, president's salaries is, I, I I look at these people and I wonder which ones you think you didn't get a good president for 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 the money you paid. Did Ad Admiral Crowder sink a boat? I don't know. So, uh, and um, I think at, at least my president is a very good president, and she's done a wonderful job. And the people who you've gotten, you keep. Uh, are, are generally good people. And you do not need to pay exorbitant salaries to get good people. You need a different kind of person. You don't need a superman or a superwoman. You need someone who has a servant model of leadership. When I asked my president, why did you take this job? She said, I really like the student body and I really was committed to making a difference in the lives of people at a Hispanic serving institution. And so that's the kind of people you want for the money you get. And that doesn't cost a fortune. And I cannot tell you what a bad message this sends to the faculty and the students when you uh, say you will pay these presidents more than they're making, the future presidents more than they're making, and yet hint about raising student tuition and try and only give the faculty a 2% raise. Uh, you're not only hurting your reputation with the students and the faculty, and I would say with these presidents, the ones you've <coughs> suggested maybe no more than chopped liver, uh, and that, but you're really hurting our, our reputation as a university with the people of California. So thank you. Jennifer Egan and Lillian Tays. Hi, um, I'm gonna replace Jennifer, but she's coming. Okay. So hi, I'm Kim Duran. I'm the Vice President of the California Faculty Association. I teach political science at Cal State East Bay. And um, I wanted to speak a little bit about the student tuition, proposed stu student tuition hike um, that was pulled off the agenda, thankfully. Um, even as presidential candidates are debating now, you know, how to figure out how we fund higher education and, and, and make it free for all students, or at least debt free. Um, we feel like the financial uh, you know, sustainability report that we've seen so far, the draft of it, you know, suggests that um, now we, now's a good time to talk about this inevitable fee hike, so we might as well get started on it and, and come up with something moderate. And we think this sends a terrible message to our students. Uh, CFA, we've gone on record since 2003, 2004, opposing all fee hikes to students. We feel like this is a public university. We have to find ways of funding this university without putting it on the backs of students and their families. We've Students have seen massive fee hikes. And even if you want to call it incremental, whatever language you want to use, it still sends a bad message. Obama's trying to figure out how to fund community colleges for free. Why can't we fund 
four-year universities for free. It's, it, why can't California be a leader in that? In order to get to that, I think I would make a couple suggestions. I know that item was pulled back, a big chunk of it was pulled back. I would suggest that students were clamoring yesterday to participate more in this process. Why don't we open up this process, invite more of our student leaders to participate, allow faculty experts who really understand the public-private partnerships and are teaching about this and working on these issues, and let's open up and have a much larger conversation. We have two faculty representatives now I would suggest several more from around the state as well as student leaders, staff representatives, trustees, and maybe even we organize our meetings that we have here. Maybe we should spend another six months using one day just to have this conversation about the future. You know, Trustee Garcia eloquently described we need to grapple with these issues. We don't need to wait for the future of this issue. And I would propose that we use the next six months to really have heartfelt conversations with everybody in this room and see, we're not gonna all agree. We're clear on the options and it doesn't seem like something's just being dropped on the students. So that's my suggestions for today, thank you. All right. Sorry, we switched order. Now I'm finally up. I'm wearing, I'm apparently wearing the wrong shirt today. Sorry about that. I used mine up yesterday. Uh, yesterday, you heard a lot of people outside, mostly faculty, but also students, of members of labor and community allies. All of them are asking you to deal fairly with the faculty. You heard from Father Will, a community member, asking you to make sure that the CSU remains a quality public institution to help families send their children to college without faith. You heard from students that they want you to honor their faculty because the faculty are important to them and their success. You heard from Art Pulaski of the California Labor Federation indicating that all of labor in California will stand behind the faculty if we need to strike. If you were outside, you heard from elected officials stating our need for increased compensation and questioning this body's use of the increased allocation for the CSU. Today, I'm asking you to please take those. But most of all, please listen to your faculty. Please believe your faculty when we say that it is increasingly hard to deliver quality higher education on the salaries you provide and with your hiring practices. We know that tenure track hiring is not catching up to student enrollments. And for that matter, the hiring of part-time lectures can't keep up with increasing student enrollments. Please believe your faculty when we say that our workloads are increasing as a result. Please believe faculty when they say that their salary is actually effectively decreasing in purchasing power and continues to backslide. A lot of us are worried that we can no longer afford to keep teaching in the CSU. Please believe the faculty when we say we feel the effects of your decreasing investment in instruction in our working experience. Please believe faculty when we, fa when we say that we face more low morale when we hear of other public employees and in educators and intellectual workers securing salaries of 5% or more. Many of these folks gaining ground are our own former students, which is great, but we're wondering why we can't catch up after the recession as well. We are the experts of our own experience. Please don't tell us how we ought to feel, how we ought to be grateful, and what we gain in psychic dollars. Please believe us when I say the faculty are angry. The faculty wouldn't let CFA's bargaining team take that 2% offer even if we wanted to recommend it. Yesterday's actions on the part of the faculty was the beginning, not the end. We can have a year of consistent labor unrest at the CSU, or you can believe your faculty that your 2% offer is insulting, unacceptable, and you can choose to change your mind. I reiterate my willingness to meet with you, Chancellor White. Good morning, Lillian Tays, past president of CFA and current political action chair. I'd like to respond to Vice Chancellor Lori Lamb's presentation from yesterday's Collective Bargaining Committee. First, Ms. Lamb indicated that there was a gap of $107.2 million between CSU management 
and CFA salary proposals. That is simply not the case. In reality, $67.8 million separates us. We believe that the resources that you have set aside for all of your employees are woefully inadequate. We absolutely believe that you should increase the pay of our brothers and sisters in the other bargaining units. They deserve it. But we will not allow you to use the Me Too clauses as a means to lowball 26,000 faculty. You did not include us in those negotiations or ask us to agree to those terms. The argument you are using is like the man who committed parricide asking the court for leniency because he's an orphan. This is a situation of your own making, not ours. We're also appalled by the list of what Cha Vice Chancellor Lamb patronizingly calls faculty success programs. First, many of the salary items on the list were negotiated and paid for out of the faculty salary pool. Second, on your part, to account for salary savings the CSU realizes when higher paid faculty retire and new lower paid tenure track or, fa or lecturers are hired. These figures do not appear on your balance sheet. Moreover, if there was any historical memory left in this building, you would know that nearly all of those so-called programs are the result of hard fought victories won through collapses over the course of 30 years. It's not law that you are taking victory laps for things that we fought long and hard to win. Vice Chancellor Lamb also wants to describe the faculty's economic situation to you by looking at full-time equivalent salaries. This approach could only come from an administration that has deliberately isolated itself from the lived experience of its employees. How can anyone possibly imagine that a theoretical salary, which is what a full-time equivalent salary is, could trump a real take-home paycheck with which people try to buy food and pay their rent? A theoretical paycheck may look neat on your balance sheet, but it does not feed our families. This is all the more callous, since most of our part-time faculty for whom you are imagining full-time equivalent salaries would give anything to have a steady full-time job. Yesterday, faculty from all over the state sacrificed their time and marched to this building to put a face on this conflict and express their outrage at the direction you have taken bargaining. They were joined by brothers and sisters from other unions, religious leaders, and members of the community, many of whose children go to the People's University. In addition to our allies, we welcomed a host of political leaders, including incoming speaker of the assembly, Anthony Rendon, and current speaker, Tony Atkins. All of them made very powerful statements of solidarity and commitments to see that there is a fair resolution to this battle. Speaker Atkins later issued a statement that said in part, quote, stonewalling salary increases for faculty will chip away at legislators' confidence in the system and maintaining that confidence is imperative as we fight to bring additional funding to the CSU. I want to be mindful of the other speakers. I'm can about wrap up done. Remarks. As leaders, we take our marching orders from our faculty. They know that it will take much more than 5% to dig out of the hole the administration left us in, in good times and bad. They know that it will take more than one year to do it. But they also know that 2% is inadequate and insulting. The truth is 5% is fair. Thank you. Pat Gant, 
Loretta Seva Estasi, um, and Neil Jacklin. Good morning, Pat Gant, President, California State University Employees Union, SCA Local 2579, and proud employee of uh, Chico State for the past 35 years. I, uh, <clears throat> I was uh, encouraged and somewhat entertained by the discussion on compensation policies and philosophies today. And I'm, I'm hopeful that those, the policy reaches to the depths of the campuses um, that we are all working on, on all compensation issues for all employees. It has been seriously lacking um, in the past at bargaining tables and at implementation of collective bargaining agreements on the campuses. But I also want to talk today a little bit about um, the CSU as a public institution. And it was noted that there are five presidential searches going on for this public institution. I was honored to be a participant in a presidential search in 1993 that resulted in the appointment of Manuel Esteban to Chico State at public institution and a public search. Five finalists, final candidates were brought to campus, each for a two-day visit, entourage, whatever you want to call it, where they met the campus community and the community of Chico and were vetted, asked questions, they asked questions for a public institution. I believe the search process helped the campus focus on what was important to it as a campus community. I think the open process helped the candidates get an idea of what uh, issues they may be facing. And actually, I think the public process um, helped us come up with a very viable candidate that served as a president for 10 years. Year of campus presidents is somewhere between four to six years. This is an issue of leadership, decisions. Is it better to protect the career of one person who doesn't want to be public at the expense of a whole campus community that is trying to work together, find its way, and determine what's important? Is the match of the campus community to the individual candidate more important or the professional career of the candidate? Yolanda Moses, Melvin Chiavelli, Dennis Hefner, Paul Weller, Manuel Esteban. You can Google them. Those were all the finalists that came to campus. You will find many of them went on to very illustrious careers after that search, even if they weren't the one chosen. In the, in the California and beyond. Four of them became presidents of other universities, some much bigger than Chico State. So I believe the process is as important as the outcome. I believe that leadership should be inclusive, not exclusive. And I think that you need to rethink your public process as far as vetting the finalists you bring to campus so that the campus community and the candidates can engage and look at the fit and the process overall and come up with the right decision. I'm also troubled that some of the trustees are worried about compensation in some areas and have sleepless nights. I didn't hear the word staff mentioned, but I also want to mention that for those with sleep disorders, I represent the staff that can help you because I represent RNs, nurse practitioners, and pharmacists. So please contact me if you need help. <laughs> I do also want to give a personal and very public thank you to a long-serving, dedicated employee of this office. Letitia Hernandez, thank you for your thankless hours and helping us get the right speakers at the podium every single time and dealing with our convoluted emails where we tried to identify the names and getting it right. Thank you. Good morning, Chan Chancellor White, Board of Trustees, Campus Presidents, CSU staff, Union Brothers and Sisters. My name is Loretta Seva Aitasi, Statewide VP of Finance for CSUEU. Yesterday, we heard a presentation about two budget versions for the CSU for 2016 17. 
one that is status quo keeping to the governor's multi-year funding plan and another that is called the CSU budget, which is 102 million, includes 3% enrollment growth with $50 million to be used for student success, which includes hiring more faculty and some staff to handle the advising to ensure students succeed. Back in 2008, total CSUU represented headcount was 16,000, which dropped to 14,000 during 2009-10 due to furloughs and subsequent layoffs at several campuses. As of October 2015, our total represented headcount is 15,516. That number will go down again after December by at least 400 or more due to retirements, temporary appointments expiring, and just staff leaving the ranks for better jobs or just moving out of the state due to the cost of living. We are looking at serving 450,000 students with 45,000 staff total among 12 or more bargaining units. CSUU has seven units, if you include units 13 and 14. In unit two, which is healthcare support, which Pat just mentioned, there are only 567 total staff for 22 healthcare centers, not including Channel Islands, which is still contracting that service out after 10 years. Unit five operations support total is at 2,139 for all 23 campuses and the chancellor's office with acres and acres of land, not to mention buildings to keep clean and let's not forget sustainability programs. Unit seven, Claire, 5,212 total staff which include academic office coordinators, payroll, and accounting techs, parking officers, dispatchers, to name a few, for all 23 campuses plus this office. Then unit nine, technical support, total is 7,591, which includes all of the technology classifications, analyst specialists, library assistants, interpreters, real-time captioners, media graphic production specialists, performing arts texts, athletic and instructional support texts, to name a few, for all 23 campuses plus this office. Many of Unit 9 support high-level, middle, and lower-level managers and supervisors. Today, you discussed a new system-wide staff compensation policy for all staff, yet specifically for presidential compensation to go above the current incumbent salary by 10%. Why? And how are you going to implement that for other employee groups? The studies say the same from five years ago to now, and at least three of the seven bargaining units low market by 13 to 16%. We have been doing more with less people who are getting less pay. The CSU has been in fundraising mode thinking to go. Well, is this a public institution of higher education or not? We need to all mobilize and plan ahead for March 29th, 2016, which is, as I recall, CS have a clear message that does not just cover 2016-17, but like the governor, a multi-year plan that is realistic and ensures enrollment growth staffing to support it, or meaningful salaries for current employees, student success, and more for deferred maintenance. We can all stand up here and say what we each want, but the reality is we, the various components of the CSU, need to work together to promote our system, the best public higher education system in the world. And lastly, I also want to thank Letitia for putting up with us and helping us all these years. You will be missed, but we wish you the best as you enter a new chapter in your life. Thank you. Good morning, Chancellor White, Board of Trustees and Presidents. My name is Neil Jacklin and President of organizing for CSUEU. I will be brief and to my point. Considering yesterday's events, I believe we can see we are in a classical struggle, struggle over resources. Both sides have valid reasons and feel justified in their stance. But consider who we will hurt the most. It is the people we are professing to help, the students. 
I hope and pray that you will reconsider your position and choose the path of compromise. Mike Chavez, Rocky Sanchez, Tessie Reese, and Rich McGee. I am the statewide chair representing Unit 5. I've been at Stanislaus now for over 15 years. As far as I've been coming here, we, the CSU, have been letting you all know about workload. I've been telling my AVP and director now about hiring more grounds and custodial due to the workload and our department it says that the grounds nor the custodial will not be increased. The past 15 years, we the custodians and grounds workers have been easy pickings for any budget shortfalls. We the Unit 5 have taken and are replacing positions due to attrition. We are the example of doing more with less. I know our campus is just like all the other campuses around the system. We are not unique. Over the years, we have not grown in size. In fact, we have less. Doing more with less. It is now the norm, even though money has been available. Grounds workers are not getting any younger, but getting older. This past month has been horrible. We had a grounds worker suffer a heart attack while he was coming in for his lunch. He had bailed out of his truck, rolling on the ground, in the quad, under our country's flag, clutched for him, the paramedics were called and were able to stabilize him. We wish him the best and hope he has a healthful recovery. A week later, just seven days, an eerily similar incident happened. This time it was custodian. He was coming in at the end of his shift, and the only way we knew our department knew something was wrong was when a student and was asking for help, that the custodian was on the ground. Sadly, our custodian, a long-time employee, had suffered a fatal heart attack. Our condolences go out to the family of Jose Bautista. When will this mindset change? We've been telling you all about our workload for a long time now. I'm sure this is not the intent you all had in mind, but this is reality. You all have to take some action and give us some mountain power to do the jobs we've been asked, we have been tasked to do with. When I talk to my representative staff from the other 23 campuses, the message is the same, workload, workload, workload. Acknowledge their concerns by hiring more grounds and custodial while others have not. Unfortunately, ours at Santa's loss has not and is not going to according to its current new back proposal for the upcoming year. Please, I am asking you, I am imploring you all, trustees and campus presidents, listen to your staff. You have the ability to hire the necessary staff to do the jobs we've been tasked to do. Thank you. Chancellor White, Board of Trustees, CSU Presidents and Guests. I'm Rocky Sanchez, California University State Employees Union, Bargaining Unit 7 Chair. I'm also, I also hail it from Cal Poly Pomona. I speak to you today regarding the surveillance cameras that have become a major issue at a number of the campuses. We have a meet and confer process in which we try to bargain over the impact that is being made on CSUEU employees. We understand that cameras are being installed for two, for two reasons. One, for safety, which is really imperative, especially in this day and age. And the other for protection of property, to make sure that not just the campus property is safe, but the students' property, their vehicles, their same thing for faculty and for staff, that we're all safe and the property is safe. However, some campuses look at the use of uh, video cameras or video surveillance cameras as a way to monitor employees, to use them to act as a time clock, to monitor the employees' workload, to make sure that they are actually doing their job, and actually taking the view of the Taylorism uh, labor practice. 
Basically, they want to use the cameras for discipline. They want to permit their managers to forego using, doing their jobs by using cameras to act as the all-seeing eye, big brother in the room. However, there are some campuses that actually expect their managers to earn their money and manage their employees. Those are the campuses that we have had success with because they have a true understanding of what surveillance cameras are used for, not for monitoring or disciplining their employees or the students or the faculty. However, we have three campuses that we have had meetings with, and they have refused to bargain in good faith. San Bernardino, San Diego, San Luis Obispo have refused to bargain again in good faith. I hope this changes soon. I hope that they come to the table again so we can get this straightened out and they understand their managers are being paid to manage their people, not to use video surveillance cameras. Thank you. Is it on? Okay. Good morning, I'm Tessie Reed. Okay. Unit two chair. Uh, I want to thank Pat Gant for taking my ha ha moment away. That we represent CSUEU. There was a passionate plea yesterday by one of the psychologists. Um, the ratio of psych As I represent Unit 2, I need to implore and say and follow up with the nurse practitioners, the physician assistants, the RNs, and even support staff in clinical at the health centers, including Unit 1, who are the physicians. We also work together with psychological services, and the fact that when those students come in, many times, Student health services are the first stop for these students before they even see psychological services because most of the time they can get in quicker to see us. Mental health is a huge issue and I know that we're all trying to solve it and we're all trying to find resources to help it. But the backlash on that is our health center's funds are being used a lot for psychological services and because of that, we see less staff in the health centers. We have less money to do the support and the needs that we feel that we need to do in the health centers. And we're all grappling at the same money. I don't know what the solution is. That's your jobs here and the president's jobs to figure that out. We certainly have suggestions and comments that might help. But I represent those folks in the too, who we just had our meeting, our board of directors meeting a week ago, well, this past weekend. And over and over again, I heard my council members, especially my nurse practitioners, my physician's assistants talking about they don't have enough help. They don't have enough staff. They're seeing huge complexity of the type of students that we are seeing. And we're all fighting for the same dollar to fill those positions. And then we come to the positions that the campuses, at least most of the campuses that I'm hearing about, and Vice Chancellor talk, Lamb talked about a salary range. We have a salary. Our employees never see the mid or high level of that salary range. So when we're putting positions out there and recruiting for nurse practitioners in particular, and physician's assistants, and psychiatric nurse practitioners and physician's assistants, it's very difficult to bring someone in when you're only offering the minimum salary range or just above that. So we're all again grappling over the same dollar, torn different, so many different ways to provide service. I just want you all to realize and understand that we also need to have that same dollar to bring in quality people at quality experience to provide the services that we need. Thank you. Rich McGee, Chair, Bargaining Unit 9. First, I'd like to thank Letitia for her service. I've been coming here since 1992, and these meetings always have around like a well-tuned clock thanks to her willingness 
her devotion to the job she does, and even though she won't like to admit this, her exceptional kindness. We wish her well in the next stage of her life, and if she'd like to become a retiree, I'm sure we can oblige you. Um, once again, folks, there seems to be no visible progress towards the development of centralized campus policies. CSUEU continues to get notice, and we continue to meet on campuses statewide over a variety of small issues, things that are common to us all, smoking, video surveillance, and yes, even the use of surveillance drones on campuses. We understand and respect the need for campus autonomy by the presidents, but issues which are common to all of us are better served by a single in addition to the meet and confer sessions that are required to discuss these policies, we wouldn't have to travel, the policy would be clearer, it would take less time, less effort, and we wouldn't have to visit 24 places to discuss the same policy 24 times. We're constantly told about how CSU has limited finances and limited resources. We ask that you demonstrate your commitment to fiscal responsibility to our taxpayers by centralizing as many of these campus policies as possible. Centralized policies make economic sense. Centralized policies make common sense. Thank you. Chair Lonville, that concludes the speakers. Thank you, Ms. Hernandez. Again, uh, thank you to everyone who has come to share your story and your comments with the Board of Trustees. That's an essential part of our policymaking process, and we appreciate all of your testimony today. Uh, in particular, um, acknowledge uh, Mike Chavez's uh, comments about the loss of CSU employee Juan Batista. Uh, our condolences, if you'd please express them to the family and, and to your fellow colleagues. I appreciate you bringing that to our attention. Thank you. As we were painfully reminded this weekend, we are one community. And while great passions may move us to disagree with each other at times, the greater passion is the one that we share for our students. It is that greater passion that we saw at the, it, in the work and the continued outpouring of support for Noemi Gonzalez's loved ones. My deepest appreciation again to everybody at, the Long, at Long Beach State who helped to organize the vigil uh, for Noemi over the weekend and to the many others who attended and offered their words of kindness. Um, she will be missed. Returning to my regular report, I speak both as an alumnus and a member of this board when I say it takes the California State University students, alumni, faculty, staff, administration, and trustees all working together to succeed. This June, we saw the success that follows when we work together. The state funded the CSU's full budget for the first time in over a decade. A big part of our success was a unified message in Sacramento. Late last month, the Association of Marketing and Communications Professionals recognized the CSU with two platinum awards for the integrated year-long Stand with the CSU effort. I want to again uh, congratulate Karen Yelverton and her team in Sacramento for the tremendous work they did to drive this effort. I want to thank the students, alumni, faculty, staff, presidents, and my fellow trustees for us all standing together. I will also uh, take a moment, uh, since I have the microphone, and will wish Karen a happy belated birthday. And while we're on birthdays, I will also wish a happy one to our very own President Eduardo Ochoa. So happy birthday to you both. You know, while disagreement is natural and I would say necessary at times, standing together is how we prevailed uh, in Sacramento this past year. And we must continue to stand together if we're going to continue building state support for years. We have an incredible case to make, the C and the CSU continues to demonstrate the value of society and economy. As you've grown accustomed in my remarks, I often share external rankings, and despite the fact that our campuses do very well, one of the big caveats is the factors being considered for rankings can be influenced by uh, the selectivity of campus admissions processes or uh, the community the campuses serve. The Economist magazine recently put out a value-added ranking. They use sophisticated regression model to determine what student, what, uh, you know, uh, what a student would be expected to make mid-career and then compare that to the actual median earnings of graduates. The result 
shouldn't surprise any of you. The CSU did exceptionally well. Cal State Bakersfield scored in the top 10 out of nearly 1,300 universities, the second highest in California, and higher than any other public in the Isbo scored in the top 30. UC campus was UC Davis at number 62. And before Tim objects to me comparing with our higher education colleagues, I'm sorry, too late, Chancellor, um, this ranking was still uh, in the top five, uh, this ranking was still in the top 5% and represents the fact that the CSU and the UC's campuses all ranked well in adding value. <coughs> our success is a team effort, and today we are saying goodbye to a member of that team. Much of the public does not see the incredible amount of work that goes into a board meeting. Since January 2001, some 15 years, the trustees have had tremendous support from the trustee, our very own Leticia Hernandez. Leticia, Monique, and many of our meetings proceed smoothly and serve as a forum for policy making and public input. But of course, that is just the start. Leticia for trustees throughout the year as we travel to campuses or represent the national level to keep us organized and focused on our mission. Leticia has served with many trustees and board chairs. It is my bittersweet privilege for well-deserved retirement. Speaking of retirements, our vice chair, the very competent Becky Eisen, recently retired from her tremendously successful and impactful career in employment law. Becky leaves the practice of Morgan Lewis uh, Bacchus LLP as one of the leading lawyers in her field. Of course, as I've informed Becky, she isn't really retiring. In addition to her many commitments inside and outside the legal profession, uh, she will continue to provide uh, more and more leadership, I'm sure, to this board. Becky, congratulations uh, on your retirement. Thank you for your continued service to the California State University. She's also got some great photos of some recent travel, so make sure you uh, get a chance to speak with her. And I'll leave it to the chancellor to speak about the recently announced uh, retirement of President Joe Sheely from Stanislaus State after two years of excellent service to the CSU. However, I did want to announce the newly formed Presidential Search Committee for Stanislaus. Trustee Morales, I want to thank you for volunteering to serve as chair of the committee. And he will be joined by Trustees Abrego, Stepanek, and Trustee Maggie White. I want to thank President Millie Garcia for being willing to serve as the president's representative on that search. And thank you all, and my many thanks again to President Sheely for his excellent years of service. Finally, amid this talk of collective bargaining and difficult choices, I want to end my report again by focusing on who we are here for, the students. Yesterday, we saw the work of many of our students at CSU Summer Arts, creativity and their passion. It is for them that we make difficult choices and balance our many institutional priorities. With that, I conclude my report, Chancellor White. Thank you, Chair Monville. I want to first echo uh, your poignant remarks on the value of community, particularly um, great communities. Times of immense sadness, and that was obviously evident this week, um, Sunday evening, when I was able to attend uh, with President Connolly. The Long Beach State community came together um, to pay tribute to Noemi, um, to offer condolences to her family and close friends and faculty and to comfort her parents and loved ones to celebrate her uh, legacy. President Connolly and her staff for organizing such a moving tribute and vigil in such a short amount of time. Uh, Jane, it was really quite stunning. And so thank you for that. 
You know, as Lou mentioned, uh, Cal State Stanislaw President Joe Sheely recently announced plans for his retirement at the end of the academic year. And Joe is a member of the class of three million. Uh, having graduated from Sacramento State, we are reviewing the manuscript, the transcripts, Joe, just to make sure that uh, is, is good. But uh, and he served us. Uh, he served public higher education for, for four or five decades, but within the CSU for uh, nearly two decades, including four as president of Stanislaw. And Joe, while I know your work at Stan State is not yet finished, I want to be among the first to thank you publicly for all that you've done for Stanislaw, for the Central Valley, for California, and indeed for the nation. Um, express my, and we'll have a chance to roast you appropriately before, between now and your in the spring. Express my deepest congratulations to uh, Leticia, uh, our secretary, trustee secretary at Leticia Hernandez on her retirement at the end of this year as well. Thanks, Leticia, for what you've done for this board and for the CSU and how you've helped me understand uh, this place in, in our three years together. When a, a faculty or staff member retires or transitions from the CSU, I find it useful to use those moments to exercise and, and reflect on the incredible contributions that all of our employees have made and continue to make for the, 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 the campus communities uh, writ, writ large. Of course, the faculty and staff are making major contributions to their campuses and even in small environments that otherwise may be overlooked. Such as the case at Cal State uh, Dominguez Hills, where groundskeepers built what is now lovingly known as Tiny Village, a small yet powerful contribution to the campus community. On that steep and seemingly uh, unredeemable slope, groundskeepers led by Peter Chance combined a real need for erosion control with art, ingenuity, and whimsy to create a miniature-sized village built entirely with found materials. It was a poignant moment viewing Tiny Village during my recent visit to Dominguez Hills and hearing of the contributions of Peter, who had passed away just last year. The facilities and ground staff that maintains Tiny Village spoke about the joy that tiny sliver of campus gives to students, to employees, and guests alike. And I thank them, as I thank all of our staff uh, and our faculty today for their contributions towards student success. These stories remind me that California State University is indeed much more than its buildings and grounds, even more than its programs. The university is a communal legacy that all of us striving together to create a better experience for our students. We have hundreds of thousands of examples from San Diego to Humboldt. Take an exemplar of Susan Wandling at Sonoma State. Sonoma State's academic talent search led by Wandling combines rigorous college readiness strategies while strengthening relationships between the university, students, and their families. The goal, as stated by uh, uh, Wandling, is to not only increase the number of students who go to college, but to empower them upon graduation. And as we continually strive to ensure quality and opportunity for our students, there will undoubtedly be times when we must come together to consider and discuss the greatest challenges facing our university and its future. I know that these discussions are not easy, nor are they always popular. I also understand as a former student and the tough decisions I make is real impact on people. And I agree with the concerns that our faculty and that our staff share. I also agree with the Public Policy Institute of California's assessment that California will require an additional 1.1 million baccalaureate educated citizens by 2030. And much of that responsibility of producing those graduates will fall to the CSU. So the challenge for this university, our challenge together, is to ensure that we can continue to provide opportunities for California students to receive the highest quality education possible by retaining and recruiting the highest quality faculty, the highest quality staff, and the highest quality administrators as is possible. And by keeping the burden of costs for students and families as low and as predictable as possible. Nearly all of the conversations we've had over the past two days have touched, and while many are in the earliest of stages, we have to overcome if we stand by the mission and the values inherent in this remarkable university. In the months and years uh, uh, ahead, I look forward to having an open and honest dialogue about the future of the California State University, and as an unapologetic optimist, I know that 
upright. Chair Monville, that concludes my report. Thank you, Chancellor. We'll now turn to the report of the academic uh, Senate of the CSU, Chair Stephen Filling. Thank you, Chair Monville. Good morning, all. First, thanks to Trustee Taylor, who made the trip over to Long Beach two weeks ago and spent an hour with us sharing opinions and strategies for the world. We really appreciate your taking the time, and I hope that others among the trustees will be suitably amenable to having a conversation with the folks who spend their time in the classroom. The Academic Senate engaged in a lot of conversation in the last two weeks, and that resulted in several official statements, the first of which AS322315 talked about a request for a suspension of the CSU background check policy, HR 20158. The reason we were calling for that suspension, the policy was implemented sometime over the summer and appears to be causing a wide disarray of problems throughout the CSU, in part because implementation seems to vary widely across the campuses. One problem we noticed, there were classrooms that did not have their faculty in place at the start of the semester because the faculty were backlogged in background checking. Another problem we noticed, the uh, community engagement and service learning programs were devastated to learn that a lot of their volunteers would have to engage in full background checks at a cost of around $90 a piece. And given that a lot of our service learning programs run on a shoestring, that meant that basically things would be canceled. Since the Senate met and passed this resolution, we've had conversations with Chancellor White and with his executive group. I'm happy to note that Vice Chancellor Lamb has committed to producing a report on implementation and applications of this policy by the end of November. We look forward to talking with her about it and making sure that we have a much more clean way forward than we've got right now. AS322815 request the addition of a retirement trustees. It strikes us that there are a lot of folks with huge amounts of experience about education and who have spent decades in the CSU. We might do well to take advantage of that expertise. AS322915 speaks to the support budget preliminary plan that you approved in committee yesterday. I note that we fully support the 3% for enrollment growth. However, we do ask that you amend the plan to include more than 2% compensation increase, significantly more than that for all employees. We'll look forward to seeing that as it goes forward. AS3234 speaks to the presidential search process and expresses our continued opinion that the best process is one in which the finalists are publicly interviewed. We, uh, I think, are riding a wave in that regard. 21 of the 23 campuses have made similar statements. And I would encourage you not to understand that is 20 catting one an astounding unanimity of opinion and process there. We, uh, have talked about this with Chancellor White. It is certainly the case that the Chancellor and we disagree. This is an example of the essence of collegiality in the academy. We disagree. Neither one, is, one of us are going to give up trying to convince the other. Conversations will continue. AS323515 spoke to the Chancellor's Office response to our request for a task force to more closely delineate quantitative reasoning requirements for CSU entry. Our problem with the original response was that we felt it marginalized the voice of faculty and we motion that faculty own the curriculum and should be primarily responsible for it. I'm happy to note that we've had conversations with Vice Chancellor Blanchard who has said that they'll take another look at that and we're hoping that can go forward in slightly moderated format. With respect to presidential searches, I'll note that Chancellor White mentioned earlier this morning that it would be wise for us to avoid an us versus them discourse. 
I'd agree with that and note that Unfortunately, I think he carried forward that us versus them discourse, noting that there are some, as he put it, very dedicated individuals sitting to my left. I agree with them, but there are also 25,000 dedicated faculty people and multiple thousand dedicated staff. Part of the reason we're all here, part of the reason our university succeeds is we're all dedicated. With respect to Trustee Taylor's suggestion that we broaden the search for presidents, understood, and maybe that works. But I'd encourage you to also understand the culture of the academy and ensure that the candidates that we try to look at do understand the culture. As I'm sure those dedicated individuals to my left will attest, faculty are probably not the most obedient of employees. It takes a different skill set to manage faculty probably than it does, pardon the phrasing, normal employees. I'd also suggest that it takes a different skill set to lead an organization that is dedicated to producing a public good rather than a profit. A myopic focus on cost reduction might maximize profits. It certainly will not maximize production of public goods and we need to be suitably attentive to that change in role. And finally, I'd encourage you to enable the success of future presidents by having the finalists speak openly in the campuses. Having the ability to interview a president means that you might not agree they're the best choice, but it does mean that you got to talk to them. That makes a huge difference when that president tries to talk you into doing something you don't wanna do. And our campuses do, should, and hopefully will continue to run on consensus. Chair Monville, that concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Filling. Now for the report of the CSU Alumni Council, President Dia Poole. Dia. Thank you, Chair Monville. Before I begin, I would also like to express to President Connolly and the Cal State Long Beach community that the Alumni Council shares our deepest condolences on the loss of Miss Noemi Gonzalez. Once a student begins their academic career at any of our campuses, they also begin their journey as a rising alum. We are so proud that the whole world now knows of her many accomplishments. Students, do all you can to keep her dreams alive and her spirit to her campus. The Alumni Council stands ready should there be any way we can assist to honor her memory or provide comfort to her family and friends. One of the pride points of any university surrounds its legacy. For some, this takes the form of athletic programs, successes, for others, their role in fueling key statewide industry. While our CSU campuses can certainly boast about both of these types of legacies, I'd like to propose that the true legacy of the California State University is how higher education improves the lives of not just our students, but for entire generations of families, our legacy families. The idea of CSU legacy families is one that I feel is at the heart of what we do. Although many of our students are in their first, are the first in their family to go to college, they often chart that course for siblings, cousins, and their own children to follow. I feel that this story, how our alumni are connected through legacy, is an important one to tell as it multiplies the impact of our states and our donors' investments in our students. Change one life, change many. We began focusing on this theme during the Class of Three Million campaign by giving alumni the opportunity to earn the Legacy Badge on their yearbook profile and display it proudly. Throughout my presidency, I plan to continue to highlight this theme and introduce you to alumni that can share their own personal CSU legacy stories. First though, please welcome back our past alumnus of Cal Poly SLO, San Luis Obispo, who earned his legacy badge. His wife and all three of his children are now CSU alumni. Thank you, Ken, for staying connected. I'm now pleased to introduce our alumni guest speaker to you. Dr. Marshall Thomas, to my immediate left, is a three-time graduate of Cal State Long Beach, earning his bachelor's degree in Asian and Asian American studies, his master's in linguistics, and his EDD in higher education leadership. So he's all almost all a legacy all to himself. <laughs> Dr. Thomas is a veteran of the United States Marine Corps where he served for six years and currently serves as the Director of Veterans Services at Cal State Long Beach. 
and he is the beginning of a CSU legacy as his daughter Madison currently attends Cal State Long Beach as well. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Thomas. Thank you for having me, and I'd like to say good morning to the Board of Trustees, Chancellor White, campus presidents, um, and, and all else who are here. Uh, it's a great honor for me to be here. Thank you for having me. I've often said there are two organizations in my life that have had the greatest impacts. The first is the United States Marine Corps, and the second is the CSU, and specifically Cal State Long Beach. I took a lot of things away from my experience in the Marine Corps, but one of the lessons that always sticks out um, is uh, how we talk about leadership. There's a saying in the Marine Corps about priority setting as a leader that says your mission and then your men. But one of my early mentors, Sergeant Michael Keitzer, said, I've learned that if you take care of your men, they'll take care of the mission. Of course, a statement like that works pretty well in an organization that is more than 90% men, so I've had to adjust it a little bit for the civilian world. And I say that if you take care of your people, they'll take care of business. And while that's lost the alliteration that was there in the original statement, it's a philosophy that's continued to serve me well. So when I reflected on how the CSU has impacted my life, I realized that it's been a series of people that have taken care of me that have gotten me to where I am today. And um, I'm going to share some of those names with you. I came to Cal State Long Beach in 1999 as an upper division transfer student, having attended two California community colleges and a regional university in central Oklahoma. And when I got here, I took a lot of English courses, but I chose my major, Asian Studies, to develop a deeper understanding and a base of knowledge for the other half of my daughter's uh, cultural heritage. And as I was about to graduate in spring of 2000, something happened that happens to a lot of students. I got an email saying, you have to take one more class that you weren't planning to take. It was a lower division English course, and I felt that I had already met the requirements, so I set an appointment to meet with the department chair of the Department of English, Dr. Eileen Klink. Writing samples and syllabi and everything I could to support my cause, and although I'd never met her before, she sat down, she reviewed all of my stuff, listened to me, and said, you know, Marshall, not only should you not have to take this course, but why don't you apply for a master's degree in English program? I thought that was pretty good advice. So, so I did, and I, I began an English program. And at the same time, I started volunteering in our Learning Assistance Center, working with students who are learning to speak English as a second language. And I actually had more to do with teaching English as a second language than, than it had to do with literature. So I reapplied to the university again, uh, and then completed a master's in linguistics with a focus on teaching English as a second language, which I continue to do today in our Department of English in addition to being the Director of Veteran Services. So as time went on and I, as I continued my studies, I also continued my professional development and, and under the leadership of Dr. Jen Ramirez, I eventually became the Associate Director of the Learning Assistance Center where I had started as a one hour a week volunteer tutor. But I came upon the realization that if I was gonna continue to advance in academia, I was gonna need some extra letters after my name. And as luck would have it, the CSU and have an educational doctorate and educational leadership. So I applied and was accepted to the first cohort at CSULB and um, very soon started looking for a dissertation topic. And I met a guy named Pat O'Rourke. Those of you who work here at the Chancellor's office may know him. He's the Director of Active Duty and Veterans, Director of Veteran Services at Cal State Long Beach. And he told me that he was trying to find a way to teach faculty and staff at the university student veterans, which I thought was great. Most people don't know much about veterans. And I had just attended a program on our campus called Safe Zone, which is a way to teach our community about the LGBT students on our campus. And those of me who, or those of us that didn't know anything about it, I thought it was a fantastic program. And I saw some parallels between our LGBT community and our veteran community. Now, for those of you that don't see the immediate connection there, student population, it's been historically mistreated on college campuses, and members of each of those communities have to decide whether they want people to know that they are a member of that community. So they, they get to decide if they're out or not. So I called my, uh, Pat back up, and I said, listen, I, I've got a plan for you here. I'll create a program, I'll write a dissertation, you'll have a program that you need, and we can carry forward. So we worked with a psychologist named Mike Barraza, developed a program. 
turned out to be a pretty popular program. And we were invited to go to different campuses around the local area and, um, and found some success there. And then Pat decided he wanted to work on his doctorate full time, so he left the university um, as an employee and started as a student in the EDD program. And I got a phone call from uh, Dr. Marianne Takamoto that asked if I'd like to talk about veteran services on our campus. So I soon found myself leaving the Learning Assistance Center and becoming a director of veterans services. And that was 2011. Since then, that VetNet Ally program um, has grown quite a bit in scope. I've been invited to 10 community colleges and, and six of our CSU campuses uh, to present VetNet Ally. I've been from our southernmost campus in San Diego to the almost northernmost campus in Chico. I'm still waiting for an invitation from, from Humboldt State so I can bookend the states here. Uh, so I've also been invited to present at universities in a few other states, and this is where things get interesting to me because while I've been talking about how the CSU impacts my life, I find it difficult to go somewhere else where the CSU has not been impactful. Western College in August, an audience member and CSU LB alum cried out with a hearty, go beach. And if you've ever uh, been to Cal State Long Beach, you know that's our rallying cry. If you've ever been to Yuma, Arizona in August when it's 114, you know Go Beach is actually good. At, it. Um, at the University of Michigan at Flint, I learned that their president was a former student affairs VP at our Dominguez Hills campus. Last week, I was at Binghamton University in New York at their very first Veterans Day celebration. I had the great pleasure to meet a, a recently retired two-star Marine Corps general. Uh, he and his wife were there, and they were very proud of their adult children, uh, one of which had gone to Humboldt State, the other had gone to San Diego State. Pretty good authority that one of our presidents, who I will not name, uh, graduated from uh, Binghamton University as well. I won't tell you, you lunch conversation starter. Well, I guess I have a message today, it's this. The CSU is impacting people's lives across the nation, and I'm just one of those people. I'm honored to be able to represent the CSU as I present work that began as a student project and has become a staple of my professional career. And finally, as we talk about legacy, you know, I can't talk about the impact of, that CSU has on people's lives without talking about my daughter, Madison. She's a junior at Cal State Long Beach studying civil engineering, which is further proof that intelligence skips a generation. I'm glad she got it. Mm -hmm. Uh, I would have invited her to attend with me today, but she's studying abroad in Ireland, and uh, I'll go visit her for Thanksgiving, but it'll be good to have her back home studying at the beach in the spring. So all of that said, what I'd like to do today is just thank all of you for, for having me here today. Thank you for all you do for this institution and for all that you do for the people that make this institution work. Thank you. Thank you, Marshall, for sharing your CSU story and for your service to this country and to our student veterans. The alumni are here to help today's student do not hesitate to call upon us. Please give our best to Madison during your visit to Ireland and tell her that we expect the Thomas legacy to continue to grow at the CSU. Thank you, Chair Mamba. This concludes my report. Thank you, uh, President Poole. The report of the California State Student Associations, President Ter Taylor Heron. Taylor? Hi, everyone. As always, CSSA is grateful for an opportunity to be here and to have an opportunity to report and share some info with you all. Uh, to start, I wanted to talk about some of the current projects and accomplishments that we're working on. So if you remember the last time I was here, I had to let you know that we're in the process of developing our policy agenda, which is the document that our board creates and adopts to help us outline our priorities for the year. So I thought it'd be appropriate to share some of those so you all have a feel for what our students have noted as the most important. The, there are three major areas to describe the focus of our work, internal affairs, campus issues, and legislative advocacy. The first is internal affairs, which is resulting in a complete overhaul of both our constitution and budget with the goal of increasing the effectiveness and impact of the work CSSA does so we can directly serve and support an even greater number. The second is university affairs or campus-based issues, which is outlined in important areas like food security, sexual harassment and assault, support for undocumented students and dream centers, and addressing achievement gaps that exist within our student body. The third is legislative affairs, which includes initiatives, 
constructively inform legislative bills and to create an even stronger presidents at both the state capitol and start to establish our federal affairs program. On the topic of CSSA legislative advocacy, I'm excited to announce a recent victory in which CSSA sponsored bill, a partnership between CSSA, the Academic Senate, and the CSU was signed by Governor Brown. AB 798 creates a grant program that our campuses can utilize to bring more free open educational resources to our classes and ultimately save students precious dollars on textbooks and other course materials. Knowing that this bill takes effect January 1st, we are working with the Academic Senate and the CSU to provide clear information about the program to the campuses. We are also working with our student to encourage every CSU campus and Senate to participate to participate in the program and ask that our many partners, especially our campus presidents, um, can help us spread the word and ensure that this gets back to your campus. I think in addition to sharing information about this bill, it just notes that textbook affordability continues to be a very important issue to students and I think an area that CSSA feels like we can be really effective in addressing. To move on to on the sustainable financial model. Even though it wasn't on our agenda today, I think it's important that our voice is still in that discussion. CSSA has been privileged and very grateful to the Chancellor and those that have invited us to be in the task force and have our voice be heard. Our board has now talked about this report three times and the plan is to pass an official that outlines, um, to be frank, our, our official, I think, opinions or outlooks on the various aspects of this report. I don't foresee it being a yes or no, but much more in depth as it relates to the implications and impacts that this has on students and also some of our feelings um, that look at the report comprehensively. Um, so moving into that, and again, I had said we don't have a, an official report. I do think that there are some important things that um, I can know. So to of the financial hardships our institution faces and that the discussion this report prompts is not only important but necessary. We support a proactive approach to addressing the challenges that jeopardize the CSU, specifically the aspects of the report that look at investing in initiatives that promote student success as a means of increasing retention and graduation rates are reassuring and exciting to see. As you can imagine, our students are wary about any discussion that involves increased tuition but are more interested in being intimately decision-making discussions rather than taking an official stance at this time. The proposal of a facility fee has raised serious concerns, and though there's not an official stance yet, I can say with almost certainty that students will adamantly oppose any fee that takes the responsibility of paying for state-owned facilities away from the state. And that leads me to my next and most important point of the student viewpoint regarding this matter. Even more than these specific areas, our students are concerned about what this report means for the future of the CSU. This report is going to redefine public education in California, and there's fear that this could set the stage for even and that the legislator will be absolved of their responsibility to fund the CSU. The CSU is about to embark on a journey that will require more collaboration, shared governance, and honest conversations that's ever been required of our institution before. And frankly, I think these past few days have shown that there is a lot of room for improvement. As this development and implementation process for the report moves forward, I think it's imperative to reflect on what has gone on regarding collective bargaining and the challenging discussions we were all a part of yesterday. CSA again does not have an official stance on CFA or the collective bargaining matter, but that does not mean that students do not have very clear feelings about this, as I'm sure you saw yesterday by the exceptional students who spoke. And since there seems to be so many people who are not part of our student body commenting on behalf of our students, I feel an obligation to my peers to follow up. Instead of talking about the specifics of the Fight for Five campaign or this matter in general, I want, to take, I want to talk about what I believe is at the heart of this matter, and that is leadership. Simply put, I believe that we can all do better and that leadership is gonna be required from every single one of us in order to create a culture where pragmatic, realistic, and above all, Honest and respectful conversations guide everything we do. In the context of collective bargaining, this means accepting that there's limited resources and that the CSU, like every other public institution in this country, is operating with a budget that is not anywhere sufficient to truly meet our needs. It means realizing that the shortcoming is in the state and federal legislature and their lack of commitment to fully fund higher education. The three legislators that joined the CFA rally yesterday are just as responsible for providing the funds for the 5% increase you are asking for as everyone in this room. CFA, will you put the same amount of energy and resources you have into lobbying those elected officials as you have the CSU? 
I can assure you that our students will be at the Capitol in droves in the coming months, and we eagerly invite you to join us in our fight to procure the essential dollars needed to meet our ever-growing demands and to hold the people who have the ultimate power accountable. I want to talk about what I don't think leadership is. To CFA, leadership is not personal tax. It's not signs with people's faces or rude comments or snickering or, or comments about chopped liver or disrespect, but rather abiding by the golden rule and treating other people with the same respect and dignity your platform is built on. It's not being so loud and disrespectful at your rally that there was a conversation here yesterday about food security that we couldn't even hear. After listening to countless comments about how everything you are doing is about our students, I found it hard to believe that entirely true after the experience in the afternoon. It was disheartening that you were not participating in the shared governance you're asking for, and that was shown yesterday when your voices were so loud they drowned out the voice of student at the exact same time you were using it to leverage your own argument. To the CO and trustees and campus presidents, leadership is not dismissal or indifferent to people's opinions, but rather listening and reacting and ensuring that people that you have power over feel heard and a part of the decision-making discussions that impact them. It means realizing that perceptions matter and that your responsibility is to provide understandable and factual information, even if you have to say it over and over again, and that is the only way to navigate situations that are as interconnected as the one the CSU faces. It means being brave enough to be honest, like some of our students were yesterday, and it also means that we respect honesty and that we treat each other with that respect when we have to have honest conversations. And it means that's especially true when you have power over other people. There have been so many references to what people deserve in relation to compensation and benefits, but what I'm asking of you on behalf of our students is to consider that what each and every one of us deserve is to be treated with respect and dignity, and it starts with how we treat each other within our CSU community. And that's where I wanna end this report, is talking about community. We were in a CSU Dominguez Hills this weekend, and to start, I was so touched and impressed by the story of the institution that there's this university that is literally introduced to a community to mobilize and educate it and education and, and create social change and that the students and the administration on campus believed in that and they believed in that sense of community. We were together, the students of the CSU, when we found out about Noemi Gonzalez. It was humbling and touching and surreal and more than anything, such a real reminder of what we are supposed to be doing here. And the fact that everything we should be doing is rooted in our students, but also rooted in goodness. And there are too many horrible things happening in the world to be turning on each other. That does not absolve us. Conversations go away. But I ask every single one of us to take a step back. It's important and to realize that the CSU and our students are, the, are what it's going to take to address the kind of challenges, the stuff that took a student who was so bright and beautiful away from us in the future. So I appreciate the opportunity to speak here today. Everything I say comes from a place of respect, from a place of wanting to be brave and honest, and most importantly, to remind us that our students are what are, should be most important to us. So with that, I conclude my report, Chair Monville. Thank you, Taylor, for those remarks and a, a good and powerful reminder. Thank you. Um, and I'm, I'm going to take the agenda out, out of order. I know we have some folks uh, with travel, and I, I want to make sure that everybody uh, in, in discussion. So I'm going to move beyond the action item and go to the consent uh, uh, agenda, which consists of the approval of the minutes from our last meeting and the approval of the resolutions that were passed in committees. All of the committee items requiring full board approval are listed in the consent agenda. Does any trustee wish to remove any item from the consent agenda for individual discussion? Chair Monville, um, at this time, if it's appropriate, at this time I would like to um, revisit the question we held earlier and propose a second amendment to the Board of Trustees policy on compensation. So, okay, so you want to remove item two from the committee and university faculty personnel? Yes. Please. Okay. I'll, I'll pull it. We'll, we'll come to that. We'll do the balance of the calendar and then we'll come to that got separately. It. Thank you. Okay, got that pulled. Anything else? Uh, hearing none, uh, 
May I have a motion to approve uh, the balance of the items listed on the consent agenda with the exception of item number two and the Committee of University of Faculty Personnel? Move it. We've got a motion. Is there a second? Second. A motion and a second for the balance of the consent calendar. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? That item, uh, those items are uh, approved with the exception uh, of item uh, number two and the Committee of uh, University of Faculty Personnel. And, and I will go to Trustee Garcia who pulled that item. Uh, thank you, Chair Monville. So, um, as discussed, and what I would like to propose is to amend the policy as so to amend the amended policy. Um, and please, everyone, help if I'm missing this. But I'm amending the amended policy for Board of Trustees policy on compensation, specific to the provision uh, related to presidential compensation is that after the sentence related to not to exceed the incumbent salary by more than 10%, that we add an additional statement uh, providing guidance that any amount in excess of the incumbent salary shall be based upon criteria such as extraordinary circumstances, knowledge and or experience or ability to contribute and advance the university's mission. And again, um, just to restate the, the, the the reasoning there is to provide appropriate guidance um, to the chancellor so that in the process of his negotiations, he has that um, framework uh, to allow him to negotiate um, in a way that will advance our overall objectives with respect to executive hiring. That's a friendly amendment to my original amendment? It is a friendly amendment. I would accept that uh, amendment. I would ask the seconder of, of my amendment if they'd accept that. Second. So we have a motion and a second to accept an amendment uh, on the policy of uh, uh, Board of Trustees policy on compensation. I would ask if there's uh, any discussion. Trustee Fagan. Just a procedural question. I just looked at another word in that paragraph that I think would be good to change it's not it's in the first line that was there before not Lupe's uh, item can I bring that up now or ever that that would you're 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 we're, we have an amendment on the table you're speaking about a part of the amendment no it's okay. the, just the line just before the amendment in the existing line. One word so change. So what's on the table is the amendment. So can I bring it up after we deal with this? Councilor? Yes. Okay. <laughs> but I need to take the amendment yes, first, correct? take the amendment first. Okay. okay. You've got, so you've, got a, you've got a first, take, of the, you, first and a friendly second. amendment that's been offered. Yep, first and a second. That, take an action on the amendment, then come back to the overall policy as an amendment. Well, actually, since it's a friendly amendment, and since you've accepted it as did the person who seconded your original amendment, it's now part of your amendment. And so now would be the time for any additional changes before there's a vote. Thank you. That's that's what I think he was asking. I want to be clear on. So what is your what is your question? I would Trustee just uh, suggest that uh, where it says when a presidential vacancy occurs, the successor president's salary should not exceed that. We I, I would think it would be a good idea to say shall not exceed. What? OK, got it. I see where you're at. I don't think it's a minor. I mean, it may be a minor issue, but it, it's an item of clarity that makes it very clear that it's not going over 10%. Should be, could be construed, construed as, as advice, whereas right. shall is a clear direction. Yeah. So I, I hear your point. I think at the end of the day, it doesn't, right, the, the power is vested here in this body. I don't know if that matters. I'll, I'll defer. I, I see hands. So uh, Trustee Eisen. Well, I agree that should is more precatory, I think is the word, and shall is more absolute. But uh, maybe I am still a lawyer. Uh, but um, 
But I think that what the chancellor said earlier is that the various changes in the language were all designed to create maximum flexibility so that we can benefit uh, the students and the institution as much as possible. So because there are so many other control uh, uh, ability of the chancellor to deviate from you know, our guidelines, I'm, I'm happy to leave the flexibility with the word should in there might help. Well, that, and frankly, that's my preference as well, given a fact, I think that was the spirit behind Trustee Garcia's, um, you know, amendment, which was to, you know, further, you know, uh, define that. Trustee Morales? I agree with Trustee uh, Ison. Can I, I just want to make it clear, then, in my understanding of this, that the flexibility you're talking about and the non-specific of shell means that you could conceivably see something going beyond 10 percent conceivably yeah. so so what we're doing here is not an absolute cap of 10 percent that the the additional amount over the previous uh, president be more than 10 percent that's at your discretion no, that's what I'm asking. I mean, is that the intent Correct. That's of what your, you have in that mind would be at your discretion. So I just want to make sure we all understand, then, that this is not saying absolutely the cap is 10%. It's the 10% cap, probably, but we have the ability. Right? Okay, and is that a change from the current uh, rule? Uh, Trustee Fagan um, heard uh, loudly and clearly from this board that there is an expectation that we would never bring a salary forward for ratification exceeded. Without having to make an exception to policy I can't negotiate beyond 10%, but if there was an extraordinary circumstance that in consultation with the board in an open session felt that we needed to offer 10.1%, uh, then you should probably have that flexibility. For all intent of the presidential compensation policy guidance but also clear expectations for me and for the candidate uh, uh, discussions. And so when I bring it to you, there's just no doubt about it. So I, I accept the, from a technical point of view, I agree that you, you may want to uh, do a 10.1% very neat, um, but my sense is that's not very likely. Trustee Farrar? Yes, Trustee I, Gonzalo, or I, I think uh, in, in all due respect, Trustee Fagan, we do understand this, and I think the majority ha has said we want to go forward, so we appreciate okay. you bringing that, and uh, I think we should take a vote. Okay, I, I did not, by the way, understand that before. Okay. I thought we really were putting a 10% cap on this, so, right. it, so is it, it makes a difference in oh, my vote okay. to understand now that we are not. We, we understand, but I mean, at this point, we can vote, and, and I, I think my board members can vote for or against it. Um, is, it is that a motion for the item as amended? Yes. We have a motion on the item as amended. Is there a second? Second. Discussion. Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 I two can no's. I, can I take a roll? Three. Three. Call, call the roll, please. Call roll. Trustee Abrego, oh, Trustee Brewer, Governor Brown, Trustee Speaker Atkins, Trustee Day, Trustee Eisen, Trustee Fagan, no. Trustee Farrar, Trustee Fortune, Trustee Garcia, yeah. uh, Trustee Kimbell, Trustee Bonville, yeah. Trustee Morales, yes, Governor Newsom, Trustee Norton, yes, Trustee Stepanek, yes, Trustee Taylor. Uh, Superintendent Turlickson, Trustee White. <laughs> oh, she does. I'm sorry, she doesn't. She, she's not voting. I'm sorry, Chancellor White. Okay. 
one, two, three, four, five. Nine, it's not a quorum. Team, no, it's... Is it? it, it this isn't a quorum, it's just oh, a sorry. majority vote. Majority. Correct, yeah. I'm sorry. Do we majority, right? Okay, yeah. I'm... <laughs> Hey, you're just trying to create a little drama at your last meeting. Yes. The uh, the item passes. Uh, the item passes as amended. We'll make sure the record reflects uh, accurately the no votes. I appreciate uh, all of my colleagues' uh, dialogue on this matter. Uh, that concludes uh, the items uh, as it relates to the consent calendar. Uh, and I would now uh, turn back to the one action item that the board has uh, before it today, and that is the recognition of the 50th anniversary of California State University, uh, San Bernardino. I know that <clears throat> all of you are probably at this point uh, sick uh, and tired of hearing about my alma mater, uh, but uh, I'm going to take uh, the opportunity uh, as we welcome President Morales up here uh, to say what an exciting time it is uh, for me and I'm gonna guess for, for Dia Poole uh, to be able to participate in this discussion and, and this item today as we recognize uh, one of uh, one of our uh, 23 fine campus on a, on a milestone uh, anniversary. And with that, I will uh, give the microphone to President Morales. Thank you, Chair Monville. I would like to thank the Board of Trustees for your recognition of our campus and its 50 years of service to the Inland Empire and the state of California. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank our outstanding faculty and staff at both the San Bernardino and the Palm Desert campuses. Nothing less than education for three and a half years ago when I joined CSUS. I spoke of a prom has been at the heart of who we are as an institution. We transform lives. This is a tremendous privilege and a tremendous responsibility. In addition to transforming the lives of our students, we are making good on our commitment to be a force for positive change in the communities we serve. Through programs such as our Inland Empire Center for Entrepreneurship, powerful stimulus for economic growth, creating new jobs, and aiding the launch of new business enterprises throughout the Inland Empire. So as we celebrate the 50th anniversary of CSUSB, we also are celebrating the community that has embraced us. That is why throughout this 50th anniversary year, we are opening our doors to the community with more than 150 special events, symposiums, art exhibits, guest speakers, performances, and much more. We would like to invite you to attend one or more of these events. They are a wonderful way to take part in our anniversary celebration and share our pride in Cal State San Bernardino. Once again, on behalf of our outstanding faculty, staff, and students, thank you for the recognition of this milestone year for our campus. While the next 50 years will bring more growth and more change, I am confident one shining ideal will never waver. We will transform lives today, tomorrow, and for as long as people seek a better future for themselves and their communities. Thank you. So um, thank you, uh, President Morales. I think before we make a formal presentation, I would uh, ask my colleagues for a motion uh, to approve the uh, recognition of the 50th anniversary of California State University San Bernardino. I have a motion. Is there a second? second? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? And now I'll go take a photo. <laughs> you want to take a photo for 
Thank you all. The board will now adjourn into closed session to discuss executive personnel matters. The board will then reconvene uh, in public uh, session. Oh, do I? Yeah. We're, that we, the board will go into closed session to discuss executive personnel matters. Uh, and, uh, and revocation of honorary degrees. Um, uh, the board will then reconvene at its regularly scheduled meeting uh, in January uh, 2016. Uh, notice will go out in normal course.